bags and bags of garbage being dumped in conservation areas. Irka says it's becoming a serious problem. And for a second year in a row, those observing Ramadan will have to do so during a pandemic. Today marks the first day of the Muslim holy month of fasting. A live look outside there as we see somebody enjoying a nice walk along the Detroit River. That grass looking green, all this rain we've been having. Collect Kennedy joins us with a look at the forecast tonight. I'm Chris Ensing. Thanks for watching. We start with the latest in COVID-19 here in Windsor, Essex. Two more people have died of COVID-19, a man in his 60s and a man in his 40s. It's been four months since someone in their 40s has died from COVID-19 in Windsor, Essex. As of this morning, there were 40 new cases of the virus. That brings our active case count to 398. 114 of those cases, they're variants of concern. As of today, more than 106,000 people in Windsor, Essex have received at least one dose of the vaccine. And part of that effort includes 57 pharmacies in the region that distributed vaccines to people 55 and older. There were 25,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine that went to those pharmacies. But according to the health unit, about 4,000 of those doses went to people outside of Windsor, Essex. Officials say it's not causing a major dent in our local vaccination efforts. So if Windsor, Essex had moved down and other surrounding areas were still at a higher age level, then people seem to um, access our sites. As much as we have seen people access our clinics from outside of Windsor, Essex County, we also are aware that people within Windsor and Essex County have accessed vaccinations outside of our area. So um, I think that you know, it's happening both ways. There's a record number of people in critical care with COVID-19 tonight here in Ontario. Hospitals are under such a strain that officials are looking at bringing in healthcare workers from outside of the province. And this is the premier pushes back against claim that Ontario's vaccine rollout is leaving some people confused and frustrated. Lorenda Redekop has the latest. The number of people in hospital with COVID-19 jumped by almost 200 in the past day to 1,822. According to the province's data, 626 of them are in ICU. Today, Ottawa's Children's Hospital announced it's preparing for the possibility of accepting adult COVID patients if needed as a way to keep patients from having to move to other cities. Sick Kids is already doing that. In the provincial briefing, I asked about the possibility of transferring patients from Ontario to less affected provinces. The health minister didn't respond to that, but did confirm Ontario could possibly accept health care workers from those areas. With respect to a workforces, if there are available teams that would be able to come from particularly the Atlantic provinces, we are certainly looking at that as an option, but we're also looking at building up capacity from our own teams. That's as the province is racing to vaccinate its way out of a worse crisis. The Premier announced last week that vaccinations would be available for all adults in hotspot neighbourhoods, but reportedly didn't prepare public health units. And people 18 plus can't book through the province's online system. There are neighbourhood pop-up clinics with no appointment needed. Ford defended the rollout. For the folks that find it confusing, I, I have to tell you, that uh, 2.8 million people didn't find it confusing. 3.3 uh, million that we had vaccinated didn't find it confusing. So uh, if I'm doing the math right, we're well over 6 million people. Folks have to dig and dig and try to, you know, it's like digging for gold. I mean, try to find uh, the solution here to get their vaccine. The province says between now and the end of May, it will receive around 3.5 million doses of Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna and recently received more AstraZeneca vaccines. The new vaccine timeline shows everyone in phase two should be vaccinated by the end of June. The former head of the vaccine task force had previously said all adults who wanted a vaccine would get one by summer. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Politicians and health officials have been describing this third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic as a race between the virus and the vaccines, but the virus variants seem to be winning and tougher health restrictions, they could lie ahead. CBC's Rafi Bujikanen has more. We need to keep doing what we know works to stop the spread of the virus. A plea from the Prime Minister as case counts keep climbing. Avoid gatherings, 
Stay home when you can. Wear a mask. Keep your distance. And anger keeps building. Demonstrations both in Alberta against public health restrictions yesterday and in Montreal two days in a row against the current 8 p.m. curfew. But from the Quebec Premier, a simple message. We think that it's helping reducing contacts. This as that province deals with another issue. It is home to the first case in Canada of a person who received the AstraZeneca vaccine and developed blood clots. We know and we have been very uh, transparent. There could be uh, one case per 100, that's 100,000. And uh, basically what we do is we follow that and we make sure that as in this case, the, uh, that person have received the, the proper care. All leading to the other big message from public health officials. There's some very good data um, suggesting that health workers that have been initially vaccinated, first of all, with the one dose has had um, really good vaccine effectiveness. And so all the vaccines that we have protect against severe outcomes really well. And yet today, just south of the border, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration recommends suspending the Johnson & Johnson vaccine after six women on a total of close to seven million people who received that shot developed blood clots. One of them died. Health Canada has approved that vaccine, but shipments have not arrived here yet. It now says it will monitor the situation closely. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Someone's been dumping garbage in two conservation areas here in Windsor, Essex. One of them was Devonwood. As Dale Molnar reports, the Essex Region Conservation Authorities asking for everyone to keep a lookout for the illegal dumpers. Workers with the Essex Region Conservation Authority had to pick up these bags of used kitty litter off the parking lot of the Tremblay Beach Conservation Area Monday. Urka says someone also dumped a load of construction material in the parking lot at the Devonwood Conservation Area in Windsor. It totaled 1,500 pounds of garbage. They say this is the worst they've ever seen. So what this does is it uses up our staff's time and, and it really detracts from the experience for all the other visitors. So um, we're encouraging people not to do that kind of activity. It's appalling. People use this as a dumping ground for whatever they don't want to put out at the curb. And I don't know why they do that. It's disgusting. But Jim Randall says he has seen it happen before at Devonwood. I've seen uh, the person right behind us there dump off all kinds of garbage in the, in the bins there. CBC did not verify this with the owner of this truck at Devonwood, but asked Urka about the allegations. What I'll be doing in this particular instance is just calling the non-emergency number and asking the police to dispatch an officer to, from Windsor Police. Money did call police after the interview, but two hours later the truck was still parked there in a no-parking zone. It's not clear if any action is being taken. Police had no information for us. Urka is also having problems with people pinning up artwork and trees at Copagarin Woods and McAuliffe Woods. And that type of uh, material such as um, bird boxes or, or various wreaths and things like that, they don't actually belong in our areas um, and uh, because there is some harm to wildlife potentially associated with that. If you see someone dumping garbage illegally in one of the conservation areas, Urka wants you to call the police to report it or you can report it by calling the phone number on one of these park watch signs that are located in the conservation areas. Del Molnar, CBC News, Windsor. Canadian Muslims will be marking Ramadan for a second time under pandemic protocols. Worship in mosques and traditional gatherings and homes will be under restrictions that vary by province and territory. CBC's Stephanie Cram brings us a story of how one Winnipeg family is adjusting. May Al Bakri carries a keepsake from the first Ramadan during the pandemic. It symbolizes the connection to family and faith. We like drew different shapes and um, we all wrote things that we are grateful for. Um, like my dad wrote, he's grateful for us in a really like nice poetic way. Four kids, each like a different flower on a garden, four colors and four fragrances. Um, my brother wrote that he doesn't have COVID-19 yet. The Albuquerque's are getting creative again this year. For the second year in a row, they're pivoting and building a space at home to pray. Last year we built our own mini mosque in our house because the mosques were closed due to COVID. 
with public health restrictions limiting how many people can attend religious events. Over the weekend, the El Bakri family once again created a mini mosque at home. And it was like a really nice chill area. Like I just go there all the time and just sit down and relax. It was really nice. The family will miss the group atmosphere and breaking their fasts with their community. Ramadan teaches you perseverance. Like sometimes it gets tough and you're really hungry. You feel really down. Um, but then you're like, I'm going to keep going. Like it's, it, it teaches you um, perseverance. Um, and yeah, like you just feel it's a big accomplishment to finish every year. For Abdul Ghani, he remembers one time fasting didn't work out so well. I fasted the whole day and then I was super hungry so I inhaled my soup. I ate too fast, I ate too much um, and then I didn't stop. So after a while, I guess my stomach couldn't hold it and I vomited. But the next day uh, I was totally fine and it didn't happen again. Tamim is the youngest in the family. It felt for me uh, very funner, but not that much when I fast a half a day. He's not quite old enough to go the whole day without food, but he's proud of fasting for half a day. It might be a quiet Ramadan, but the Al-Bakri kids are excited. They're happy they have each other, their faith, and their mini mosque at home. Stephanie Cram, CBC News, Winnipeg. As you saw there, Ramadan, usually a time for the community to come together. Here in Windsor, Essex, people are being encouraged to celebrate the month-long religious holiday at home. But unlike last year, mosques are allowed to offer prayer at 15% capacity. People definitely not happy, but they have to abide, you know, they have to follow the rules, whatever the rules they have. This is for their own safety and security, and people cannot just do whatever they want to do because they will put other people's life in jeopardy. So that's why they have to follow whatever the health um, uh, unit and the health um, officers gave that uh, rules and regulations. They have to live with it. Windsor Moss says with the restrictions, it can only accommodate around 200 people as opposed to 1,500 that it can usually take in. It will also be giving priority for in-person prayer to younger people, with the exception of children and people who have been vaccinated. Every evening at sunset, the mosque will be broadcasting it on, the call to prayer outdoors. People are invited to come and witness that from their vehicles. The mosque says it recognizes it's not ideal, but it says that's just how it is right now. It's the best that we can do for right now, given the circumstances. I mean, typically in prayer, you're shoulder to shoulder. So to be six feet apart, it's safe right now, and that's the way we have to do things. But it's, it definitely takes away from that feel when you're actually in, in deep spiritual state, just praying with other people around you and that sense of brotherhood, sisterhood kind of thing. And along with the holiday comes some guidance from the health unit. They're reminding others that people are forbidden from visiting different households during the stay at home order. People should stay at home and pray with members of their own household. And if people do not do want to connect with others, they can do so virtually. Now, for anyone who does choose to go to the mosque, they're being asked to maintain distance, to wear masks. They're also being asked not to gather outside after prayer and to visit only one local mosque and follow the rules that are in place. The federal government says it will provide Air Canada with as much as $5.9 billion. In exchange, the airline will restore flights on almost all suspended regional routes and it will refund customers whose flights were cancelled last year because of the pandemic. Anyone who's seen the endless miles of wheat and canola as they drive across the country can tell you just how big Canada is. In a country like ours, air travel is an essential service. About $1.4 billion has been set aside for the airline to process and issue refunds to customers. That will start this month. It's agreed to several other stipulations, including an agreement to cap compensation for company executives at $1 million a year. Air Canada said it would maintain its workforce at the current levels. It has almost 15,000 Canadian employees, less than half the workforce it had when the pandemic had started. It's back, and Werner's fans could not be more thrilled. The distributor has apparently turned the ginger ale tap back on. Michelle Scott was one of the first to spot it at a Metro grocery store in Windsor late last week. It was at the Metro at the mall, and the, the guy was bringing out a big skid of, of Werner's, and I stopped him, and I'm like, are you real? And he's like, yeah. So I'm like, don't move. So I got my cases 
my husband is the Verner's drinker in the family and has been going through such withdrawals of not being able to have Verner's. In fact, he paid $50 for a 24-pack tw- of bottles of Verner's. Absolutely love the joy of what we can have with just a little bit of pop in a can. There's some excitement in the air. Spring is out. The sun is there too. Colette Kennedy's up next. She's going to give us a forecast and it's going to be great, I hope. A 12-year-old boy in Manitoba is recovering after a pretty scary situation. He thought he was jumping into a puddle, but soon found himself stuck waist deep, freezing in muddy water. My right leg went through, and it immediately went up to about halfway up my shin. And, uh, uh, and then I kept gradually sinking from there. Here he is, just moments after he became trapped at a sinkhole last weekend. His friend was able to flag down a woman who got in touch with his parents. Dad couldn't pull him out, so they called 911. The rescue crew you see there, they started getting stuck in the mud themselves. But eventually, they were forced to call in the city's vacuum truck. After more than an hour in that sinkhole, Samuel was pulled three, spent a few days on crutches due to some soft tissue injuries. 
Both Samuel and his family say they're grateful to the rescue team. Joining us now for a live look at the weather is Colette Kennedy. Colette, the sun is shining mm. out there in Windsor today. It looks beautiful. Yeah, yeah, just some beautiful conditions. Nice to see really comfortable temperatures too. You know, April, I was thinking about this earlier and you know, not that we look at months as though there are things that we can trust or not trust, but April is not a month that I generally trust uh, because we it kind of teases us that, hey, everything's like mild, we're into spring, and then all of a sudden uh, a dose of something else comes your way and winter returns. Well, they're really feeling that right now in Manitoba, <laughs> yeah, in the southern prairies, this area of low pressure, and I pointed out, because it's coming our way, but not with the same conditions, they're looking at a snowfall warning right now in Winnipeg. They've had nearly 15 centimeters and may get another 10. So yeah, 15 to 25 centimeters in that uh, area there. So coming back with them right now with the uh, winter uh, making another appearance. So very nice to have the sunshine and some temperatures here into the upper teens that we're currently experiencing. Okay, Chatham Kent, 14 degrees there. Your winds coming out of the south to southwest as well. Now those get a little lighter tonight. We generally have clear skies or just a few clouds, but as that system approaches, what happens is we get into more cloudiness through the day tomorrow. So we'll see some increase in cloudiness and then a chance for some spotty showers. And yes, I know you're seeing some flurries here Wednesday night into Thursday. I think it's unlikely we will pick anything up. You might see an odd white flake, but it's just we're not going to be quite as cool uh, near the surface here. Some cold air in the upper atmosphere. We do get into some rain showers and drizzle though as we go Thursday into Friday and we'll see the temperatures dropping back just a little bit. So overnight tonight, this is what they're looking like for you. Those overnight temperatures with the mostly clear skies, they cool down a little bit. So a low of two degrees for Windsor and for Leamington there and three degrees elsewhere. And you know, tomorrow afternoon, this is what, you know, I'm putting clouds here on the icons. I just, what I want to express is that there will be sun earlier in the day. It just is gonna take some time and then it becomes more overcast and some showers will begin to develop later on. So there's where the temperature comes down a slight bit into Thursday 11. See some drizzle more than a steady showery activity will be some drizzle into there and then Friday a mix of conditions 13 degrees into the weekend though a couple of twins there at least right now with 15 degrees and kind of variable skies we'll be seeing sounds good thanks says Colette you're welcome Chris a CBC favorite ending tonight we hear from a cast member of Kim's convenience on what the show meant for them
The police officer who shot and killed an unarmed black man in the Minneapolis area has resigned, and the chief of police has as well. It comes after another night of unrest as protesters clashed with police over the man's death. There are Dozens of people were arrested last night in the Minneapolis suburb after a series of skirmishes between police and demonstrators. The unrest sparked by the weekend shooting of 20-year-old Dante Wright during a traffic stop. The veteran police officer who fired the shot that killed Wright says she mistakenly grabbed her gun instead of her stun gun. That officer, Kim Potter, resigned today, and so did the chief of the police force. It all comes as the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin continues. He's facing a number of charges, including second-degree murder and the killing of George Floyd. And health authorities in the U.S. are now recommending a pause in use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. They say that there could be a risk of blood clots. Canada's first shipment of the vaccines are slated to arrive later this month, but there is now a lot of uncertainty about its potential use here. Maybe before this vaccine lands on our doorstep, we will have some modified guidance as to who should get this and who should avoid this. Health Canada has asked Johnson & Johnson to provide information on cases of blood clotting. Almost 7 million doses of the company's vaccine have been administered in the United States. Few side effects have been reported, but the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the FDA are investigating unusual clots in six women between the ages of 18 and 48. Britain is cautiously reopening some public spaces after shutdowns triggered by COVID-19. Today, there were words on walls to describe the emotions around the opening. The most powerful word in there for me is reunion. Um, we've all been apart from each other, um, friends, loved ones, um, colleagues. Words like freedom, hope, family, reunion and beer were projected onto some public buildings in the style of Scrabble, letter, tiles. The company commissioned a survey to find words that represented the nation's mood as lockdown measures were lifted. They staged this event on National Scrabble Day. In a few hours, the final episode of Kim's Convenience will air. The comedy series about a Korean-Canadian family running a store in downtown Toronto is ending after five seasons. One of the stars is Paul Sunhae Young Lee. In an interview with the Na Nationals' Andrew Chang, he talked about the feelings around the show ending. I know I'm still emotional about it. Some of the other cast members are as well. Um, but at the same token, it's like, to what end would that serve it? Uh, I really wanted to sort of turn the page in a sense um, and, and take the good from Kim's Convenience, all the groundbreaking work that we did, all the barriers that we broke through, uh, the representation that we, we showed, and, and take that with me instead of how it ended. Uh, now, I think there's a time and a place for that discussion, too, because I think for the industry to grow and evolve and to protect and nurture BIPOC artists behind the camera as well, this is a hard conversation that needs to be had. Uh, that's the only way to grow. And it's not going to be, it shouldn't be about finger pointing or, or you didn't do this or you didn't do that. It, this Kim's was the first show of its kind. And a first show is always going to make mistakes. But for us to grow as an industry, we need to learn from those mistakes without judgment, without people tisk tisking. We're all human beings and we make decisions that maybe weren't the best in the long run, but worked at the time. I'm really excited for what he's able to pull off next. That full interview, it airs tonight on The National at 9 on CBC News Network and 10 on CBC TV. And that's it for us here at CBC Windsor News. Don't forget for news anytime, you can go to our website, cbc.ca slash Windsor. We're on social media too. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We live stream the show on Facebook and Twitter, and we're always looking for those beautiful photos that you take of Windsor Essex. We pop them up on our feeds, share them with everybody else. So please take us in those as well. The Rick Mercer Report is up next. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.